Ambante ti saranena sa pancia silani yachami dutiampi ambante ti saranena sa pancia silani yachami tatiampi ambante ti saranena sa pancia silani yachami Utasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambudhasa Namo Tasa 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 Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arato Sama Sambuddhasa Buddhang Saranam Gachami Buddham Saranam Gachami Dhammang Saranam Gachami Dhammam Saranam Gachami Sanghang Saranam Gachami Sangam Saranam Gachami Dutiyampi Buddhang Saranam Gachami Dutiyampi Buddham Gachami Dutiyampi Dhammang Saranam Gachami Dutiyampi Dhammam Saranam Gachami Dutiyampi Sanghang Saranam Gachami Dutiyampi Sangam Saranam Gachami Tatiyampi Buddham Saranam Gachami Tatiyampi Buddham Saranam Gachami Tatiyampi Dhammang Saranam Gachami Tatiyampi Dhammang Saranam Gachami Tatiyampi Sangham Saranam Gachami Tatiyampi Sangam Saranam Gachami I Saranagamanang Nititang Ama Bante Parnati Pata Viramani Sikhal Padang Samadhyami Parnati Pata Viramani Sikhal Padang Samadhyami Adina dana ve ramani sikha padang samadhyami. Adina dana ve ramani sikha padam samadhyami. Kami su michahachara ve ramani sikha padang samadhyami. Kami su michahachara ve ramani sikha padam samadhyami. Musa vada viramani sikha padang samadhyami. Musa vada viramani sikha padang samadhyami. Sura miraya majapamadathana viramani sikha padang samadhyami. Sura miraya majapamadathana viramani sikha Pamada Tana Vera Manisika Padam Samadhyami Himani Pancha Sikha Padani Silena Sukating Yanti Silena Boga Sampada Silena Nibuting Yanti Tasma Silangwiso Dhaye Sadu 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 now concentration is described under the heading of consciousness in the phrase develops consciousness and understanding it should be developed by one who has taken his stand on virtue that has been purified by means of special qualities of fewness of wishes, etc., and perfected by observances of the ascetic practices. But that concentration has been shown only very briefly, and so it is not even easy to understand, much less to develop. There is therefore the following set of questions, the purpose of which 
is to show the method of its development in detail. One, what is concentration? Two, in what sense is it concentration? Three, what are its characteristics, function, manifestation, and proximate cause? Four, how many kinds of concentration are there? Five, what is its defilement? Six, what is its cleansing? Seven, how should it be developed? Eight, what are the benefits of the development of concentration? Here are the answers. What is concentration? Concentration is of many sorts and has various aspects. An answer that attempted to cover it all would accomplish neither its intention nor its purpose and would besides lead to distraction. So we shall confine ourselves to the kind intended here, calling concentration profitable unification of mind. Profitable, again, is uh, wholesome. Uh, as we talked about last week, I would prefer wholesome wholesome unification of mind. Thank you, Bhatt. Three, in what sense is it concentration? It is concentration, samadhi, in the sense of concentrating. Samadhana, what is this concentrating? It is the centering, adhana of consciousness and consciousness concomitants evenly. Samang, and rightly, samma, on a single object. Placing is what is meant. So, it is the state in virtue of which consciousness and its concomitants remain evenly and rightly on a single object, undistracted and unscattered, that should be understood as concentrating. Four, what are its characteristics, function, manifestation, and proximate cause? Concentration has non-distraction as its characteristic. Its function is to eliminate distraction. It is manifested as non-wavering, because of the words being blissful, his mind becomes concentrated. Diganikaya 173. Its proximate cause is bliss. Bliss is just sukha, so probably happiness is a better translation. Again, remember this is the this is what's called the Lakanadi Chatuka, the the mm-hmm. fourfold explanation starting with lakana so lakana rasa pachupatana and padatana five how many kinds of concentration are there one first of all it is of one kind with the characteristic of non-distraction two then it is of two kinds as access and absorption three likewise as mundane and supramundane four, as with happiness and without happiness, and five, as accompanied by bliss and accompanied by equanimity. It is of three kinds, six, as inferior, medium, and superior, likewise seven, as with applied thought and sustained thought, etc., eight, as accompanied by happiness, etc., and nine, as limited, exalted, and measureless. It is of four kinds, ten, as of difficult progress and sluggish, direct knowledge, etc. Likewise, eleven, as limited object, etc. Twelve, according to the factors of the four jhanas. Thirteen, as partaking of diminution, etc. 14, as, the, as of the sense sphere, etc. And 15, as predominance, and so on. 16, it is of five kinds according to the factors of the five jhanas reckoned by the fivefold method. One, herein, the section dealing with that one kind is evident in meaning. Two, in the section dealing with that of two kinds, access, concentration, is the unification of mind obtained by the following, that is to say, the six recollections, mindfulness of death, 
the recollection of peace, the perception of repulsiveness in nutriment, and defining of the four elements, and it is the unification that precedes absorption concentration. Absorption concentration is the unification that follows immediately upon the preliminary work. Because of the words, the first jhana, preliminary work is a condition as proximity condition for the first jhana. So it is of two kinds as axis and absorption. So what this is saying is that there are some of the many kinds of, of samatha practice that don't have the capacity to lead to proper absorption jhana concentration. So they lead to something that is called access concentration. Or it, access is a, is used in a, in a way, or used to be used in a way to refer, I guess it's still used, as the access to something, and in other words, the area around it, how you get to the thing. But but it doesn't mean access as we normally use it. Upachara literally means something like the area around or neighborhood. Is It, it used to be translated as neighborhood, or it sometimes is called upachara. It does mean something like getting close to. But neighborhood is really the idea. It's in the vicinity of jhana. Another thing that's maybe a little bit interesting here is the word parikama. So preliminary work, you're going to see this this word, this term used again, parikama. Parikama is the meditation practice. It's the preliminary work. And this is basically usually the reciting of a mantra. So when, for mindfulness of the Buddha, you would say buddho, buddho, that would be your parikama bhavana. Bhavana development, parikama, the preliminary work. So, in our practice, all that we, everything we do is preliminary work. Just like with samatha, the preliminary work is what leads to jhana, right? He says here, the jhana follows directly upon uh, the parikama bhavana. But our parikama bhavana leads to lokuttara jhana. So, it's all parikama bhavana, it's all, all preliminary work for the purpose of. Anulomayana and the higher stages of knowledge and the cessation of suffering. So so this is what this is the idea that I use whenever asked about whether eventually the meditation should drop the noting. There are even some fairly well respected teachers who have started affirming the the idea that you should eventually stop noting. Which really doesn't I, I don't see how it is supported by the texts, which are pretty clear that everything up until jhana is called parikama bhavana, is, is, is the very same practice. It doesn't change, you don't stop with the parikama bhavana. And that applies to samatha, it should really also apply to vipassana. There's no reason to stop noting until you reach nibbana, until you reach uh, the lokuttara jhana. I think it's more that people generally don't like to use the noting and they just can't wait to, to be free of it, which is, which is bizarre. I mean, honestly, it's it's not actually the noting that they're likely against. Some people are against the very idea of it, but what makes it hard to bear is the fact that the noting brings you closer to the bare nature of the object, which is in no way appealing because it's impermanent suffering and non-self. So it's a very unpleasant, un, well, uncomfortable experience uh, right because it's funny that people should want to give up the noting when when a, the same sort of people or, or most people are very keen to, to take the mantra if it's a summit object like and you ask people to say buddho buddho they have no problem but you have people say rising falling the same people will most likely see no hypocrisy in in being very much against or unhappy to have to note rising falling Ajahn Tong said, it's because it's not the name of the Buddha. For Thai people, that's pretty, that resonates, I think, because in Thailand, of course, you want to say Buddha, Buddha, because it's the name of the Buddha. That's a great thing to say. But who wants to say rising, falling? What a useless word to say. I mean, there's nothing good about the stomach, nothing special about it. So they find the mantras in other traditions are very, um, very mystical, very spiritual. Some groups say Samma Arahang. There's a very prominent group in Thailand 
for a long time has said Samma Arahang, which is basically just as though saying Buddha, Buddha, it's just qualities of the Buddha. People like saying those mantras and they'll never tire of it. In China, they have a mantra that Namo Amitafa, where they chant the name of their Buddha and uh, a Buddha that they've pretty most likely just made up and then started to believe in. Uh, but they chant it thousands and thousands of times a day. And they'll never keep that up. But ask anyone to say rising, falling, and it's very uncomfortable. Number seven. Three. In the second dyad, mundane concentration is profitable unification of mind in the three planes. Supermundane concentration is the unification associated with the noble paths. So it is of two kinds, as mundane and supramundane. The three planes here are bumi. Bumi. Translated as plane. I think realm is much more common throughout Buddhist history. I don't know which is better. Bumi, I think, literally means earth. It doesn't, isn't bumi a word for earth? I'm not quite sure. But anyway, there's the, the, the three realms are the three planes of existence, I guess is the idea. The sensual plane, the rupa plane, the, the form plane, and the formless plane. The form plane and the formless plane are the two Brahma, two types of Brahma realms. But you'll often hear about the three realms or the three planes or whatever, the three bumi. And then there's the four bumi. The fourth bumi is the, I think Nibbana is also called a bumi. So there's the four different bumis. Maybe that's why realm doesn't really work, because Nibbana isn't really a realm. I can't remember if Nibbana is considered a bumi. Lokutra bumi, yeah. Lokutra bumi. It is called a bumi matibata. It is not a place. I've read that it's just. Referring to yeah, that. so realm is... But what does the word bumi literally mean? Bumi. Yeah, ground earth. It, it literally is, yeah. is a word for... An ancient word for earth. Planes of existence, no? Yeah. No, I was just trying to remember what the word... It, it is just a synonym for the earth or for earth, ground, soil. So it's yeah, evolved bumi. to mean something more than that. Like the bumi sparsha, you say, in where the Buddha touches yeah, the earth? It also means land. Yeah, I just have a question about uh, what you just said uh, about uh, the earlier uh, paragraph about access concentration. Uh, that uh, so we are noting our noting technique can cannot lead to any other sorts of jhana on, only lokuttara jhana. Yes, it cannot because the object is not stable. The object is impermanent. It's, the object is the five aggregates. Only focus on a concept can lead to jhana. That's what I was going to ask. So if if people don't do it correctly, basically they are not following the experience itself, but they focus on the word, then it, it does lead just the mantra, right? Well, yeah, but the thing is, to focus on the word, you'd have to what? Say word, word, or something? Or how would you even focus on the word? Because the word comes as a part of your affirmation of the object. You say a word because of an experience, so it's a reaction to an experience, or it's a neutralizing of the reaction. So, in order to focus on the word, what would that even mean? I mean, what word would you be focusing on? I think Bhante, you are doing it correctly so often that you don't you don't have any idea how it's done wrongly. So sometimes well, I know what some people see the words in their mind. Yeah. I don't know how you'd focus on that. See I mean, how could you make that with samatha? I mean you'd have to say something like word, word. Oh, just rising, falling, but it's just the word. Did you say that instead of uh Focusing on the, the elements, patavi apotejavaya, the uh, meditator focuses on the concept of the belly. I don't even think okay. saying rising, falling would work because the word isn't rising, right? The word is a word. So I don't see how that could even lead to jhana. It's, I mean, it's, it would be a weird. So for, the, for the jhanas, if you, feel, if you see white, you have to say white, white, white. If you see rising in your mind, you can't say rising and somehow get jhana. I don't think that would work. 
It's just, it's like... Um, like ana panasati. Yeah, it's true. You can count the breaths, right? One in, one out, one in, two out, two. But I don't think that's what leads to the jhana. It talks about anapanasati is really odd, the way anapanasati is supposed to lead to jhana. I don't know that we have to really get into detail about that, but I did want to say that some of the the ones that don't lead to jhana that it mentioned, remember some of them that don't lead to jhana? It says here, the cha anusati, the six anusati, and marana, sati, mindfulness of death, and so on. It's because so some of the some of the the forms of what are called samatha meditation actually do take ultimate realities as objects, and that's why they can't lead to jhana. So it's not quite cut and dried the taking of ultimate realities or the taking of of concepts. But the, then you could say that those ones that take ultimate reality as an object could theoretically lead to vipassana or be used to practice vipassana. And what you could also say is that most likely it's proper to think that vipassana meditation also leads to access concentration because it similarly takes ultimate reality as an object. So it could be also called access concentration. It isn't, I don't think, but it's called something like, it, it's said to be of the same nature as access concentration, upachara samadhi. You know, that's all just technical because there's these arguments about whether it it actually has the power to suppress the hindrances. So, for example, the practice of body scanning. Yeah, that's that's not really a practice. That is, that's not an orthodox practice. I heard, yeah, I heard about that. But one example, one curious example is mindfulness of the Buddha. Mindfulness of the Buddha. Buddha Nusati is actually takes ultimate reality as an object because it focuses on the qualities of the Buddha and those mental qualities are ultimate realities. It's a bit odd. And I don't think it really could be used for vipassana, but theoretically it could be. But I think the reason it really couldn't be is because though they are ultimate realities, they are not things you are experiencing. You are still conceptualizing them because you can't experience the Buddha's wisdom, right? You can't experience the Buddha's enlightenment, but you take it as an object. You, you reflect on the Buddha's wisdom, the Buddha's enlightenment. So you're taking an ultimate reality as an object, but it's an ultimate reality that you can only conceive of conceptually. I think that has something to do with what with why it isn't classified or, or it doesn't count as vipassana. 8. 4. In the third dyad, concentration with happiness is the unification of mind in two jhanas, in the fourfold reckoning, and in three jhanas in the fivefold reckoning. Concentration without happiness is the unification in the remaining two jhanas. But access concentration may be with happiness or without happiness. So it is of two kinds, as with happiness and without happiness. 5. In the fourth dyad, concentration accompanied by bliss is the unification in three jhanas, in the fourfold and four in the fivefold reckoning. That accompanied by equanimity is that in the remaining jhana. Excess concentration may, may be accompanied by bliss or accompanied by equanimity, though it is of two kinds, as accompanied by bliss and accompanied by equanimity. 6. In the first of the triads, what has only just been acquired is inferior. What is not very well developed is medium. What is well, well developed and has rich mastery is superior. So it is of three kinds, as inferior, medium, and superior. Okay, I was confused there. You see, he's using confusing words. If you notice, um, those of you who, the keen people who know things about the jhana factors, concentration without happiness is the unification in the remaining two jhanas. And I was trying to think, why do I understand this wrong? Because happiness is only in is in all four of the or is in four of the five jhanas, right? Or three of the four jhanas. Do you get yeah. what he's doing here? He's, yes, what I he think... said sounds wrong. But it's not wrong, it's just that his translation is different. 
he's using he translates piti as happiness which yeah. is what i suspected piti probably shouldn't be translated as happiness that just doesn't make much sense whereas sukha should literally be translated as happiness we have to watch for that we're going to see this again probably where he says happiness it's referring to piti which is something like excitement or rapture yeah it's interesting i would put bliss as the zeal for joy and happiness as suk for sukha yeah it's so obvious because sukha literally is i mean it's the very simple bland sort of word that doesn't ever really mean bliss hmm. note 6 explains his reasoning for that oh yeah hmm. Uh, here we are. They're almost synonymous. That's interesting. Can you read that? In loose usage, PT, happiness, and sukha, pleasure or bliss, are almost synonyms. They come, become differentiated in the jhana formulas, and then technically piti, as the active thrill of rapture, is classed under the formation's aggregate, and sukha under the feeling aggregate. The valuable word happiness was chosen for piti rather than the possible alternatives of joy, which is needed for somanasa, interest, which is too flat, rapture, which is overcharged, or zest. For sukha, while pleasure seemed to fit admirably where ordinary pleasant feeling is intended, another less crass word seemed necessary for the refined pleasant feeling of jhana, and the bliss of nibbana which is not feeling aggregate. Ease is sometimes used. Neither painful nor pleasant feeling is intended here by equanimity, upekka, on looking, for it looks on, upekati, at the occurrence of bodily pleasure and pain by maintaining the neutral or central mode. No, I think rapture is better. I don't agree with his idea that rapture is overcharged because... Um, the word piti is used in the Visuddhimagga, among other places, to describe these states of being enraptured, being um, uh, like hypnotized, like in a raptured a, ra a state of rapture, like the Christian rapture, where if you've ever seen these people who go into rapture, they I'm not even sure if they use, they don't use the word rapture themselves, but someone is enraptured. We use it to refer to these states of meditation where you, your body starts swaying back and forth, or you feel very light, or you feel thrills. We'll, we'll see when we get to the, well, we'll see, not, 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 not soon. We'll see in the, in the Banya Nidesa, the third part of the book, there's a period where it probably just briefly mentions, now that I think of it, I'm not sure where it talks about the different types of piti, but they are talked about in some detail. Mahasi Sayada has a description of the five types of piti and common to talk about them in the Thai circles as well. It certainly doesn't mean happiness. That's not how it's used. Piti kwam imjai. In Thai they translate it as what's the equivalent of having a full stomach. How do you say in how do you say for the body satiated? Like like satisfied when you're full. It's like when the mind is is full. The mind has had a good meal and it's full. It's satisfied. But im im means full. It can also be the idea of overflowing. Like rapture is the overflowing. These states of um, swaying of the body is like you have you're you're overcharged. The mind is overcharged. So ecstatic, ecstasy maybe. Maybe ecstasy is a good translation for piti. That's an interesting one. That, that's the, the term they would use in, in most Christian circles. Or sometimes they would also call it like a, a, a lightning bolt from heaven. Like you have lightning moving through your body or something. Uh -huh. Yeah, it was quite interesting. I saw a documentary or part of a documentary where these kids were going and were swaying back and forth and they're getting into these states except they think it, it's God or something. It's an example of how you misinterpret these simple states of hypnosis, of self-like hypnosis, basically. I mean, thank you for 
pointing out this Bante though, because uh, I think I never uh, seen this translation used for, I mean, just the opposite that uh, what you were just, so rapture is for PT and actually pleasure or happiness is for Sukha in any other book that I have read, I yeah, think. Well, this is, this is earlier than most of those books, most likely. This was translated in the 50s, 1950s, I think pretty old and he had some of his own ideas about how to translate Yanamoli had some he did a great job but some of his choices are well, as you can see I still disagree with some of them first type of uh, PT Kudika PT is just uh, making your hair straighten and then Kanika PT is like a, you are getting a shock the doctor Kudaka, Okantika, Kanika, Okantika, Okanta, Upega, Upega, Parana. Parana, that's the one. Parana is this suffusing piti. goes through the whole body. Upenga is where you feel light, uplifting. And Okantika, which one's that? Okantika is like a uh, waves hitting the shore. Waves, the, the, yeah, right. That's the rocking yeah. back and forth. That's what I was thinking, yeah. Where your body rocks and shakes. So that, it's pretty obvious from that description that it, it, it happiness is a, it's not a good translation for PT. That's the problem you, here. You, you mentioned, uh, that I talked about the, um, the different types of PT and DT, Abante. Uh, do you know which, which text that is he discusses that in? In a text you're not supposed to read. Oh. Well, he, he says not to read it unless you... He starts out by saying this is that this is made for people who have already gone through courses of mindfulness, intensive courses. But then at the end of it, he says, well, actually, it could maybe be useful for newcomers. It's an interesting text. It's actually fine to read it. It's not very in, de in detail. Oh, okay. But it's not the kind of thing you want to obsess over. Okay. I'll, I'll hold off on that one for now, though. I'll, I'll wait till, uh, till the right time to read it. Thank you. Yeah. Here's his description. It's not in that much detail. Bunda, what about joy? I thought that PT was translated as joy. Again, I don't think that's an accurate translation. If you read this description from Ahasi Sayada, you can ask yourself, does this describe joy? It really doesn't. So Although joy, it is related, you see. A sublime feeling of happiness, feeling the body, you see the sweet and subtle thrill. The whole body is risen up. That's Upenga Piti. Floating up and down. Yeah, it's not joy or happy. It's exuberance. I mean, it's it's. there's something in the mind here that makes you exuberant and ecstatic and all of that and it's accompanied with happiness but it's not happiness and it's not joy those are words for vedana those are words for sukha vedana and somanasa vedana that's how i um separate that this one i mean zest or oh, what's the word that it has a it has a very powerful effect on the body you yeah, the way I've see. described it is it's like getting in a groove. Yeah. We say in English, you get in the groove. And why that works is because when you're in the groove, the same thing happens again and again. You get in a groove and it'll happen repeatedly. And for on a negative side, we'd say you get stuck in a rut. And when you get in a rut, it means you can't get out of it. So you're you're constantly in this. So when you practice meditation repeatedly, repeatedly, You'll develop this sort of static charge because you're in a you're in the groove, but it can also be a hindrance to practice if you go well, to mindfulness practice if you get distracted by it because you start to really get in the groove and you get groovy in the sense of you know you start shaking rocking back and forth or some people cry for hours and that's related to PT or some people laugh. Even yawning, Ajahn Tong said yawning can be caused by PT. If you just keep yawning. On, on the other hand, PT is also a bodhjanga. That's right. 
So you've got to be in the groove to be to become enlightened. It means your mind has to be fixed, sort of fixated or or intent, entranced. We don't have we don't yet have haven't yet come to a definition of piti, but those are the ideas behind it in a general sense. And it's not Vedana, so it should never be translated as happiness or joy. Eleven. Seven. In the second triad, that with applied thought and sustained thought is the concentration of the first jhana, together with access concentration. That without applied thought, with sustained thought only, is the concentration of the second jhana in the fivefold reckoning. For when a man sees danger only in applied thought and not in sustained thought, he aspires only to abandon applied thought when he passes beyond the first jhana. And so he obtains concentration without applied thought and with sustained thought only. This is said with reference to him. Concentration without applied thought and sustained thought is the unification in the three jhanas beginning with the second in the fourfold reckoning and with the third in the fivefold reckoning. So it is of three kinds as with applied thought and sustained thought and so on. Twelve, eight. In the third triad, concentration accompanied by happiness is the unification in the two, two first jhanas in the fourfold reckoning and in the three first jhanas in the fivefold reckoning. Concentration accompanied by bliss is the unification in those same jhanas, and in the third and fourth, respectively, in the two reckonings. That accompanied by equanimity is that in the remaining jhanas, access concentration may be accompanied by bliss and happiness or accompanied by equanimity. So it is of three kinds as accompanied by happiness, and so on. 9. In the fourth triad, limited concentration is unification on the plane of access. Exalted concentration is unification in profitable consciousness, etc., of the fine material sphere and immaterial sphere. Measureless concentration is unification associated with the noble paths. So it is of three kinds as a limited exalted, and measureless. 10. In the first of the tetrads, there is concentration of difficult progress and sluggish direct knowledge. There is that of difficult progress and swift direct knowledge. There is that of easy progress and sluggish direct knowledge. And there is that of easy progress and swift direct knowledge. Herein, the development of concentration that occurs from the time of the first conscious reaction up to the arising of the access of a given jhana is called progress. And the understanding that occurs from the time of access until absorption is called direct knowledge. That progress is difficult for some, being troublesome owing to the tenacious resistance of the inimical states, beginning with the hindrances. The meaning is that it is cultivated without ease. It is easy for others because of the absence of those difficulties. Also, the direct knowledge is sluggish in some and occurs slowly, not quickly. In others, it is swift and occurs rapidly, not slowly. Herein, we shall come and below upon the suitable and unsuitable, the preparatory tasks consisting in the severing of impediments, etc., and skill in absorption. When a man cultivates what is unsuitable, his progress is difficult and his direct knowledge sluggish. When he cultivates what is suitable, his progress is easy and his direct knowledge swift. But if he cultivates the unsuitable in the earlier stage and the suitable in the later stage, or if he cultivates the suitable in the earlier stage and the unsuitable in the later stage, then it should be understood as mixed in his case. Likewise, if he devotes himself to development without carrying out the preparatory tasks of severing impediments, etc., his progress is difficult.
it is easy in the opposite case. And if he is not accomplished in skill in absorption, his direct knowledge is sluggish. It is swift if he is so accomplished. 17. Besides, they should be understood as classed according to craving and aids, and according to whether one has had practice in serenity and insight. For if a man is overwhelmed by craving, his progress is difficult. If not, it is easy. And if he is overwhelmed by ignorance, his direct knowledge is sluggish. If not, it is swift. And if he has no practice in serenity, his progress is difficult. If he has, it is easy. And if he has no practice and insight, his direct knowledge is sluggish. If he has, it is swift. Also, they should be understood as classed according to defilements and faculties. For, a man, for if a man's defilements are sharp and his faculties dull, then his progress is difficult and his direct knowledge sluggish. But if his faculties are keen and his direct knowledge is then swift, and if his defilements are blunt and his faculties dull, his progress is easy and his direct knowledge sluggish. But if his faculties are keen, his direct knowledge is swift. So there's this fourfold categorization based on whether your practice is of swift fruit, so whether it bears fruit quickly, whether it takes a long time for you to be to, to reach the goal. And then there's based on whether it is it is challenging or easy, comfortable or uncomfortable, basically. Gives you four different types. So here it's an interesting discussion on the different reasons why one person might be one or another. What is meant by, uh, in chapter 16, it says the suitable and unsuitable. I mean, he says that we shall comment on, on the suitable and unsuitable. So is this like what is proper for a person to develop or because of their char character, maybe? Yes. Mm hmm so this is important. Well, it's important for samatha practice more than vipassana. Uh, what's being translated as direct knowledge here? Abhinya. Abhi, I think, means more like higher or high knowledge. Abhi means, usually means high, special, that sort of thing, I guess. So as regards this progress and this direct knowledge, when a person reaches concentration, with difficult progress and sluggish direct knowledge, his concentration is called concentration of difficult progress and sluggish direct knowledge. Similarly, in the cases of the remaining three, so it is of four kinds, as of difficult progress and sluggish direct knowledge and so on. Interesting. Also, in paragraph seventeen, it only uh, the I mean, he only mentions lobha and moha, right? And no dosa, basically. So these are the two that uh, are very important for concentration. Yeah. Well, it's like in the Satipatthana Sutta commentary. They're likewise. Separated into raga and titi. So tanha, tanha is associated with raga, passion, and avicca is associated with titi, or vice versa, I guess. I'm, I'm not. I'm just. I'm just thinking like how, uh, like we think. Oh, we are disliking so many things during our practice, and that's not the problem. The liking is more of a problem. Right? That's not how I thought. I, I mean, I thought like maybe craving might be including the craving for not wanting things, kind of a thing. Yeah, it can be. We bhavatanha. What's the word for craving then here? Tanha. Tanha, okay. So we have a new monk. Ricardo is ordained successfully. 
I said, I said, oh, you made it. He said, yeah, it was painful. <laughs> so I don't know quite what that means, but I guess it was painful to kneel on the, on the hardwood floor. They really torture the new applicants here, and I'm not quite sure why. It's a hardwood floor that they have to kneel on, and Chom Tong, they have a cushy carpet in the ordination hall. It's great for, great for ordination. Do we have pictures, Bente? It's probably on their Facebook page. Hmm, that's true. I'm guessing there's pictures there as well. We could look. Lisa has a question in the chat. She asked, uh, what's his Pali name? Pante. Kitty Palo. There's pictures on their website, on the Facebook page. And uh, yeah, Mechi Siri was his mother. His mother wasn't here, so instead, Mechi Siri was his. Here's a good, here's a great picture. This is Ricardo. No, oh, didn't show the picture. Can I copy the image and do this? This works. Okay. Doesn't Kitty mean fame? Uh, yeah, a reputation. One who guards the reputation. So it means one who practices well so they don't they don't destroy the reputation by practicing poorly. Is there anyone on this call that would like to be ordained or are planning to be to ordain? I have a question regarding uh uh, the Venerable's ordination. I mean, he requested the ordination, Bhante. Uh, did uh, anybody mention about the tattoo? Uh, because I heard that some temples don't uh, ordain monks uh, with tattoos. Well, there's a there's an injunction against a branded someone who is branded with a tattoo, but that means they've been branded as a thief. So if someone steals in some places in India, they would they would put a tattoo like on their forehead to uh, signify that they were a thief. Yeah, it's an unfortunate place to have a tattoo. <laughs> we had someone who wanted to ordain. I think he ordained as a novice, uh, and he had a Christian big big Catholic cross on his on his bicep right there. I guess he can get it removed if he really wanted to ordain. It was it was huge though. Just like in a maybe lighter vein, uh, like Anguli Mangala was ordained after being like a murderer and things. So I don't know if uh, you know uh, even if someone was a thief or something, yeah, maybe what onto the bridge kind of. So. Maybe weird question: How old is he? Is uh, Ricardo? I think he's about my age. So it's uh, it's like ar around 40 and 45 that people are ordaining nowadays, not earlier. Well, these ones, we have three who yeah. are around the same age. We prefer people in their 20s, I think. Why? Well, they've, they've got more energy and more, more fresh. These guys are getting old. Yeah, but Bante, they are completely disappointed of of the world of the worldly life. So, well, there he's twenty enough. years old who are disappointed of the world. No, no, I mean the forty something years old. Hmm. I think they understand better <laughs> than twenty years old people what they are doing. No. I think it is uh, discouraged to ordain older people because uh, people are using monasteries as an old age home and they have no place to go. <laughs> I, th I still think that uh, older men or women can, I mean, can understand better what they are doing by ordaining than 20-something uh, people, for sure. Uh, but they have more strongly ingrained habits. Young people are more malleable. It's a, it's yeah, it's a, it's not a cut and dried. One is better, but the Buddha recommended, I think, younger people to ordain. He was a bit critical of older ordination, or not critic. Yeah, critical, I guess, is the word. Pointing out the disadvantages of ordaining when you're old. 
All right, that's all for me. Thank you all. Have a good week. Thank you, Bhante. Thank you, Bhante. Thank you, Bhante. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Thank you, Thank you all. Thank you, sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.